We are in the midst of a study of the Protestant Reformation, this being the 500th anniversary of. So if you, if you missed last week, you're in a world of hurt, all right? Look on as best you can. By the late 15th century, the sacramental system of salvation by merit had produced in Europe a tension between leadership and laity. In the leadership, there was corruption and they were abu- there was abuse. It was commonplace. There was also a rising tension between the church and the rising nation states, France, England, Germany, and the like. There was a 72-year move of the papacy from Rome to Avignon, France, called the Babylonian Captivity. Out of that came a 39-year schism between who was the pope? Was it uh, an Italian or was it a Frenchman or a third pope that came alone as a candidate? There was a failure of the conciliar movement of a council to check and balance the, the papacy. And altogether, these had brought a great lack of confidence among common men and women in who was running the church. The Eastern Empire in uh, Constantinople had fallen to the rising power of Islam. Uh, The Crusades had pretty much proved a disaster. Any challenge that you made to Rome that had to do with theology Uh, You could end up in excommunication or you could end up burned at the stake. And so if reform was going to come like everyone wanted, as a matter of fact, just before this, people referred to the papacy as the pornocracy because there was so much immorality in it. So if there was going to be reform, God was going to have to do a sovereign act. He would have to engineer it by himself. But on November the 10th, Close to midnight in 1483, the light broke. In a German mining town, a tin mining town of Eisleben, Germany, a common town of very common people, there was a man who had prospered in the mining industry, and his name was Hans Luder. I think we have a picture of he and his wife. He was just another pretty face. And Hans and his wife, Margaret, on November the 10th, 1483, right before midnight, brought forth a boy. And he was given the name of the Catholic saint of that day, Saint Martin. Martin Luder, L-U-D-E-R, was born. And this young man, Martin, showed early on that he was going to be able to make a living by his brain, not just by his back as a miner, because he was smart. He was precociously smart beyond his years. And so his father decided that he would be a lawyer. And he enrolled him at the University of Erfurt, Germany. Martin changed his name from Luther to Luther, a more polished sounding name, in keeping with his father's social aspirations for this son. Martin was serious about religion from his youth, too serious for his father. And then his father's worst nightmare occurred. Martin quit law school to become a monk, to join a monastery, and to pursue a life of poverty. He had been walking back to Erfurt from a visit home when suddenly he was caught in a July thunderstorm and a lightning bolt hit so close to him that it knocked him down. And without the chance of final confession to a priest, without last rites, the prospect of hell loomed before this young lawyer and he hit the ground and a vow came out of him that would make a line through history. He said, Saint Anne, the patron saint of minors, save me and I will become a monk. And his father was furious as Martin kept his vow. As a matter of fact, Martin and his father did not speak for years. Nevertheless, to the monastery he went, to a world of rules, rules how to to bow, how to walk, how to talk, how to look before others, how to hold eating utensils. You lived alone in a tiny cell, and every few hours, You got up in the middle of the night at 12 to go to service. Then you would go again at service at 6, another at 9, another at 12 noon. And those days, a monk's life was to earn heaven. The problem was, 
that young Martin uh, had the same problem as all men who are trying to earn heaven by their own righteousness and are honest about themselves, that you are never sure in yourself that you are as good as God calls good. And this was Luther. He did all that Catholicism asked of him and more. And yet he found his soul, he said, to be a continual sink of continual corruption. Individual Bible reading was not allowed generally. You were told to think what the teaching magisterium of the upper level thought about the text and what history determined the text had been. And so you did not read your Bible. Uh, Luther found a private spot in the monastery library, and with a Bible he found there, he would pour over the pages in silence, trying to find a way out of his quandary, which was the righteousness of God, the holiness of God. How could Luther measure up to a holy God when he was continually aware that his life, he said, was like cleaning a dust-filled room? The more you work, the dirtier it became. Well, the righteousness of God was his greatest fear, he said. He wrote later, love God, I hated him. His fear was that he could never measure up to what the Puritans called that righteousness, which God's righteousness requires God to require, and none less. As a matter of fact, other priests at the monastery hated to see Luther coming for confession. They knew they were going to be there for hours as he would dig into every nook and cranny and wrinkle of his life, giving actions and motives that were somehow disfavorable. But in 1510, he had an opportunity that he hoped would provide his answer. He was given the duty of traveling to Rome on monastery business. And now he would be able to behold for the first time in his life the Holy Mother of the Faith, Rome, and he was beside himself with joy. The city was crammed with relics, he said. He said he wished inwardly that his father and mother were dead, that he could go make prayers for them and earn their way out of purgatory. He ran from relic to relic, from holy spot to holy spot, but he said, as he beheld the frenetic religious energy of the city, a familiar doubt returned. How do they know any of this will be an advantage to me? And if they do know, says who? The Bible doesn't. How do they know? The religion that he did see was shallow and driven by money. He saw a priest who would say masses so fast that they could rake in money while another group was coming. His anxieties as a monk increased, and he returned disenchanted back to the place of his monastery. When he had to perform his first Mass, he trembled so greatly before God that he could not hold the cup and the bread. And he wondered how he could ever become a, or a, a priest. Well, his mental talent became more obvious to the monastery, and Luther was transferred to the city of Wittenberg that boasted a brand new university, and perhaps they thought in the study of Scripture, as he was now assigned to teach the Psalms and the letters of Paul, perhaps now he could sort through his concerns. When it, it appeared when a man was going crazy as a monk, you made him a college professor. And so he is now a professor of theology. The problem was he had never read his Bible. He had read what Thomas Aquinas thought of it, what Luther thought of it, what Anselm thought of it, but he had never read it himself. It was not considered virtuous to know your Bible. It was considered virtuous not to know your Bible because you were trusting in fully of the teaching magisterium of Pope on down and church fathers to tell you what it said. Well, at this time, God began to work in this young educator's life. 
The Pope needed money for the rebuilding of St. Peter's Cathedral. I think it was built like in the fourth century, and now a thousand years later it needed refurbishing. And to do so, the Pope commissioned the selling in Germany of what were called indulgences. An indulgence is a monetary payment of penance to take the place of penance. And you pay money, and it will strike from your uh, owing of years in purgatory. Well, you could either pay for yourself or you could pay for a loved one and get them out of purgatory. There was an old adage that said, when a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. Who would not pay to get their mother out of purgatory? Well, many of us are aware of what happened. Luther began to see the people of Wittenberg sinning with great impunity because they had purchased from a fellow named John Tetzel, the Pope's official purveyor of indulgences. They had purchased from him indulgence. Matter of fact, there is a story about John Tetzel being robbed outside of Wittenberg. And he shouted at the robber, may God condemn you to hell. And he shouted back and said, oh no, you sold me an indulgence. So he got a get out of hell free card. Well, Luther observed this impiety toward God. And in 1517, Luther nailed 95 what were called theses or propositions to the door of the church at Wittenberg, opposing the notion of indulgences. Not the Pope, not anything else, not Catholic theology per se, but this one thing the impunity you had toward God because you had a receipt signed by John Tetzel. All of Luther's contention was with this repentance-less seeking of salvation. The Catholic Church, the Catholic Church's stance would widen that conflict. It was simple. The Pope says that indulgences are valid. The Pope is the final authority. Thus, indulgences are okay. The issue was brought to a formal hearing. Because Luther's ideas had gained steam throughout Germany, because so many Germans were tired of paying taxes to Rome simply because of an Italian pope. So it was political. They rallied behind Luther, so a debate was arranged in 1519 to put the public quietus on this monk. A debate is arranged at Leipzig between Martin Luther and a theologian of the church named John Eck. I believe we have Mr. Eck there. The debate lasted 18 days, and it moved from the validity of indulgences to the elephant in the room, the issue of who has final authority. Is it the Bible? Or is it the church? Tradition. Never one to mince words, Luther blurted out, a council may sometimes err, but neither the church nor the pope can establish articles of faith. These must come from the Bible, words that had not been heard since John Hus and John Wycliffe. Eck quickly pounced on the inference. You then, Mr. Luther, you agree with John Hus, whom they had burned at the stake, guilt by association. But Luther insisted on scriptural proof. Show me in the Bible that popes had authority over purgatory. Luther's argument is, if the pope can let people out of purgatory, why doesn't he just give a blank check and get us all out in his mercy? Wycliffe and Hus lived again in this pope. Hus's swan that he prophesied of was now singing. We would like to think that Luther's conversion was like a lightning bolt that changed his career, but historians differ as to when Martin Luther was converted. Was it prior to the 95 Theses, or was it after the John Eck debate that brought him face to face with the real issue of authority? Most agree that Luther's salvation was, however, over a period of time, 
Luther had the answers, but he didn't know what they meant. And he had to wrestle within his own heart. He had no one to go to as a reference point who had written earlier, except maybe Wycliffe or Huss. And so he struggled to find the righteousness of God. He struggled particularly with one verse in Romans 1. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the righteousness of God for all who believe. Or it is the salvation or the power of God of salvation to all who believe. And then Paul said, because in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And he pushed back from his Bible. The righteousness of God was his greatest fear, that standard that he could not meet. And here it says that the gospel is the power of God to salvation because in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. And he could not understand that word. How can the righteousness of God be unveiled and not earned? And it is revealed from faith to faith, meaning from beginning to end. It is sola fide. And it dawned on him that the righteousness, that God's righteousness requires God to require. No man could earn that it was lived by Jesus Christ who died for what we did, our lack of it, and now bestows on the sinner the estate of acceptability by the mercy of God. And Luther wrote, Night and day I pondered until I saw the connection between the justice of God and the statement that the just shall live by faith. Then I grasped that the justice of God is that righteousness by which through grace and the sheer mercy of God, God justifies us through faith. And then I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through the open doors into paradise. That was his conversion. The repercussions were now obvious. If salvation comes through faith alone, sola fide, then the intercession of a priest is needless. Amen? Simple logic. Faith formed and nurtured by the word of God, both written and preached, requires no monks, no masses, no prayers to the saints, and Luther tipped the whole row of Catholic dominoes, they all fell. The mediation of the Church of Rome crumbled into insignificance. And the church understood this. And this was the man that the Pope now would face. A man whose belief was forged not through study, but through wrestling with his own tortured heart. His faith had found a resting place. Not in device nor creed, but in the person of Jesus Christ, who had graciously provided him with the gift of the righteousness of God. Martin Luther experienced the Reformation before he preached it. And so he began to teach of the grace of God in the college chapel, in the Wittenberg chapel. And something happened that is the sheer work of God. Students started coming to chapel. His chapel services became so popular that the students couldn't fit in the Wittenberg Chapel. They had never heard words like this. And so they moved the chapel to the Wittenberg Church. And the townspeople came to hear this new teaching to such an extent they could not fit the townspeople in. Luther became a sensation. He put his case before the German people because by Luther's day, there had been an invention by a one Gutenberg, and it was called movable type in the printing press. And so nothing could have been more providential because now Luther's ideas went out like milkweed all over Germany. 
He produced first a series of pamphlets that you could read very quickly. One was called An Address to the Nobility of the German Nation, where he called on German princes in the 200 German principalities or states to correct the abuses of the church and to strip bishops and abbots of personal wealth and of places of personal power and to create a German national church that did not answer to Rome. In his pamphlet, The Babylonian Captivity of the Church, he argued that it was not France who had commandeered the church. He said Rome had commandeered the church. It had taken it away from Christ and enslaved it to the Catholic sacramental system of works where nothing could happen between a Christian and God without the mediation of Pope and priest. He set forth there were only two sacraments, that of baptism at the beginning of the Christian life and the Lord's Supper to the end, needing only the community of believers, not a formal priesthood as in the Old Testament. And as all were priests and all Christians could draw near to God with nothing but conversion and an open Bible. Amen? It sounds old to us, but people had never heard such a teaching. His third pamphlet was called The Freedom of the Christian Man, and his main idea was that the inner spiritual freedom that came from the rebirth produced the love of God and the desire for good works. That good works were not the means to salvation. They were the result of salvation by a heart that was enlightened. What moved man was appreciation for God's love, not the fear of purgatory. He felt men did not need to serve God as monks and priests and nuns, but in the nobility of their own jobs and in what was called the Protestant work ethic to the glory of God. Luther and Germany became like two ships. He and the, and the, the Catholic Church became two ships squaring into position. One had to go. In Luther's thinking, the church was removed. In the church's thinking, Luther had to die. In 1520, Pope Leo X, I believe we have one of Leo, handsome fellow, he issued a papal bull, Exerge Domine, and it gave Martin Luther 60 days to repent or be excommunicated. It meant that no one within any Catholic country could ever receive him or give him shelter. Luther publicly burned the papal bull. He said in Wittenberg at a bonfire, they burn my books, so I will burn theirs. The new Holy Roman Emperor, whose name was Charles V, now faced what was called the German problem of disunity in the Catholic Empire. He summoned Luther to Worms, Germany, to give an account of his writings. And when Luther was asked, do you recant any of what you have written, or do you stand by it? That is a, a great painting of the Diet, or rather the, the, yeah, the, the Council at Worms, the trial at Worms. There you see on the far left, you see on the throne, Charles V, with kind of his nappy-looking hat, all right? And you see the crowd around him of Catholic leaders looking at this one that is the lowest in stature, and that is a mere monk with his monkish tonsure around his head. And so he was asked, do you recant? He said, give me the evening to think about it. And he went home, and he went through all that he had written. If anything he had written was contradictory to the word of God. He said, I can't ask if it is contradictory to the church because the church has always contradicted itself. Luther insisted the next day that his final authority on all things had to be the Bible. When asked to recant his position on the Bible, salvation and the priesthood, he responded with the now immortal words, my conscience is captive to the word of God. I will not recant anything. For to go against conscience is neither honest nor safe. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Amen. And when the classic biography was written on Martin Luther, it simply was entitled, Here I Stand. 
But Charles V was a company man, and he called Luther a devil in the habit of a monk who has brought ancient errors into one stinking puddle. The Pope said he was a wild boar loosed in the Lord's vineyard. He was given 21 days to make his way home to Wittenberg, and then he would be considered an outlaw and none could shelter him. But that time never came. The prince of Luther's principality was named Frederick the Wise. Frederick? A very well-known man. There were six electors in Germany that cast votes for the nation, and he was one of them. And he was sympathetic to Luther's cause. And he had Luther, quote, kidnapped by friends of Frederick. As he rode home, they came around him, and everybody thought he was dead, and they grabbed him, and they took him away to a castle that was called Wartburg Castle. And there it is today. And he grew a beard, and he wore the clothes of a nobleman and was simply known as Squire George. There we have Squire Luther. I can't tell who it is, can you? That's, that's Martin Luther. And no one in Germany knew if he was dead or alive. He spent nine months sequestered at Wartburg Castle. And during that year, he translated the Greek New Testament into German. And to begin plans to now reshape public and private religious life and worship in Germany. Uh, an interesting note, there were 200 principalities in Germany, and most of them spoke different dialects. And so Luther had to not only translate the Greek into German, he had to invent the German language as he went along. He had to put words down that all Germans could use as a reference point. So he invented German as he translated the Greek. And throughout Germany at this time, the revolt against Rome now spread from town to town as statues were removed from churches and simple communion replaced the mass. In many of the churches, there was a metal grating that was put between the priest and the people that they could not approach the communion elements because the, the priest would come out around the grating so they were kept from coming back. And now in what became Lutheran churches, those gratings were cut down and removed. Political figures, princes, dukes, and electors defied the, the condemnation of Luther. They defied it by giving support to the new movement. The rent had finally come in Catholicism. Small, but still a rent, a tearing of Catholicism. Luther reappeared, and he abolished the office of bishop because he found no scriptural basis. He abandoned and abolished the notion of celibacy, that priests cannot marry. He took monks, and he married them off to nuns, officially. Uh, one older nun he could not find a husband for, so he said, I'll marry her. And he did. Her name was Katie, Catherine von Bora. Martin said, she has far less faults than most women. <laughs> Germans are hopeless romantics. <laughs> there was now a new image in the Catholic Church. It was not of a bionic believer priest that was separated from you. It was a common man. The communion elements were removed from behind and put before. And now the priest was like a father calling the people to a common Lord's Supper. He was no better than them, nor worse. They were all in the body of Christ. Latin was not spoken now in the churches. Now German was spoken. The emphases of worship changed from the mass to the elevation of the pulpit and the Word of God. But a bad thing occurred. It was called the peril of the pendulum. It swung too far. German peasants now within the feudal system of a peasant being married to the Lord and the land and never leaving it. Peasants within the feudal system revolted against their lords as Luther did against the Pope. Like reformers, the peasants demanded biblical proof of serfdom. 
that had been around since the Middle Ages, early Middle Ages. Or they wanted its abolition and release from their excessive services. When the complaints turned to violence, Luther lashed out against them and he called the princes to, quote, knock down, to strangle, and to stab. As, quote, nothing was so satanic as an insurgent. Princes crushed the revolt at the cost of what they would do to some of the peasants. How many German peasants do you think died? 100,000 died in the peasants' revolt. The surviving peasants considered Luther false, and many returned to Catholicism. You might wonder why Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, the Pope's muscle, why did he not militarily crush the Reformation? It was because of this man. His name is Suleiman the Magnificent, the Ottoman Turk that began pressing from Constantinople all the way into Europe, beginning to conquer European lands. And so Charles V had to deal with him, and he needed German muscle. And so, choosing between Suleiman and Luther, he took Suleiman to oppose. And by the time Suleiman was dealt with, the Lutherans were too numerous to kill. Such is the providence of God. By 1530, a summit of Reformation leaders gathered at one of the most significant places in history. It was called Augsburg, Germany, to draw up a common reform statement of Protestant faith. We know, Martin, what you don't believe. What do you believe? And so at Augsburg, the Augsburg Confession was placed in the hands of Luther's disciple, a young Greek professor at Wittenberg. His name was Philip Melanchthon. He was still in his 20s. Uh, Luther could not attend the Augsburg Confession because there was still a price on his head. So he ended up dying as an outlaw. His, his wife, Katie, once said to him, Martin, you have become hard. And he said, Katie, they made me that way. On another occasion, he came to the breakfast table depressed and despairing at how the Reformation had been doing. And Katie disappeared and came back all blessed, dressed in black. He said, what are you doing? She said, I'm getting mourning for the funeral. He said, who died? God. The way you act, God must have died. That was Katie. I'm married to Katie. ain't funny. <laughs> and so they drafted the confession that was signed by all. The Catholic emperor was no more inclined, however, to reconciliation with what were now called the Protestants or the Lutherans. He was no more inclined than he had been at the Diet of Worms. Luther died in, 19, in 1546. One biographer said he died an irascible old man, petulant, peevish, unrestrained, and at times positively coarse. He would denounce anyone who disagreed with him with an authority that was reserved for the Pope. He counseled one of his political supporters, Philip of the Principality of Hesse, to enter into a bigamous estate of marriage. He just said, keep it quiet, it'll just be between us. He spoke of the Jews at times in language that resembled Hitler. But one thing you learn about all of these reformers is that God uses flawed, sinful men to accomplish his will. Amen? Everybody go, whew. That's who he uses. They simply were men that tenaciously held to the sufficiency of the Bible and to the sufficiency of Christ's death. They would not move. That was a reformer. In 1530, Charles V made it clear his intention to crush Lutheranism. Lutheran princes circle the wagons as they did in Bohemia a hundred years earlier 
around John Hus. They circled the wagons, and it was called the Schmalkaldic League to defend itself as Lutherans against Catholic aggression. And between 1546 and 1555, nine years, civil war raged in Germany. And they were religious wars called the Wars of Religion. Nothing is nastier than a war of religion. In a war of armies, you defeat the army, and the people are now under your subjection. In a religious war, you have to kill the ideology. You've got to kill the mothers, and you've got to kill the children. And it is a bloodbath. And so it was with the wars of religion. A compromise was reached in 1555 called the Peace of Augsburg. And when you study politics, you study the Peace of Augsburg. It was revolutionary. And it allowed, it just called off the wars. No one had won. They just called it off. And they said, each prince of every German principality will decide his religion, and it will be the religion of those who reside under him. The word was, he that has the region has the religion. And so if you were Catholic, it was Catholic. If you were Lutheran, it was Lutheran. No more wars. All sects became, except Lutheranism, were forbidden. The Reformed ideas of John Calvin, Anabaptist ideas that had begun in Switzerland, they were forbidden. You could be Catholic or you could be Lutheran, but that was all. Religious opinion was now the private property of the prince. And all in his jurisdiction could only worship Catholic or Lutheran. It wasn't religious freedom. It was simply the religion or the freedom not to be a Catholic and still live. That was revolutionary. But a split had come and it would never mend. It was crude, but it was durable. And since the Peace of Augsburg, every Protestant church that has ever lived, if they're going to trace back their origin, will trace it back to the Peace of Augsburg. Because it grew from Lutherans to the Reformed, to the Anglicans, to the Methodist, to the Bible and found a resting place in the United States where full toleration was granted. And so Martin Luther, what he did when you shake it down is he took four basic questions that had been answered wrong and he answered them biblically. Number one, how is a person saved? Not by religious works and the sacraments. You are saved by the gift of righteousness through faith alone in Jesus Christ. Amen. Sola Scriptura. Sola Fide. Sola Christe. Christ alone saves. Secondly, where does religious authority lie? Luther said, not in the church, not in the traditions, not in the edicts of the Pope, not in church history. They're good guidelines, but they're not the Word of God. They are chaperones. That is all they are. The authority of the Father comes from the Bible. The Word of God only that is found in the Bible. The church does not create the Bible. The church merely recognized what was the Bible. Thirdly, what is the church? Is it an elite group of priests, popes, and bishops, and the rest drafting on their ministrations? Luther said no. It is the entire community of Christian people not just the priesthood. All could now read the Bible. All could now approach God for supplication and confession in and of themselves, needing no prince, I'm sorry, no pope and no priest to grant them access. There is but one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. We draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we might receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need to our sympathetic high priest. Every time you open a Bible on your own and bow your head and talk to God 
as a child of God, Luther was the one who ran in front of that idea and took the hit. Fourthly, what is the essence of Christian living? Is it is serving God in any useful calling, whether you're a layman, whether you're a housewife, or whether you are ordained. That's the priesthood of all believers. And the fire spread, unknown to all but God, two months after the birth of Luther in a Swiss village that was called Glarus, G-L-A-R-I-U-S, a boy was born who also would become a Catholic priest, a boy who would also become discouraged with the Catholic Church, and who, independent from Luther, not knowing of Luther and Luther not knowing of him, would start reading the Greek New Testament and would come to the same convictions of the authority of the Bible, the, the solidarity of Christ, and would be saved. He would also go through great turmoil. He caught something called the Black Plague, and he lived, and he found God. His name was Ulrich Zwingli, who would now pastor a church in Zurich and announce to his congregation there would be no more readings or homilies. I am going to teach you, he said, the book of Matthew. And they said, Who's Matthew? <laughs> he became your first Reformation Bible expositor. Luther became your reformer. And years later in Switzerland, as through Zwingli, the Reformation spread to, to Switzerland, there was a particular city named Geneva. And in Geneva, a young French lawyer would come by the name of John Calvin. The great reformer, the great preacher, and the great theologian and writer, John Calvin. All would be at the same time. All would hand the baton to each one. Well, let me ask you a question. I say to you, do you believe in life after death? Most people would say yes. If I said to them, are you going to heaven? Ask a man here recently, he said, I'm about 75, 80% sure. I wanted to say, if you got on a plane, would you mind them saying, you know, it's an 85% chance it's going to land? Probably wouldn't. So do you believe in life after death? Question. When you die, are you going there? You most assuredly will die. Will you go there? Will you go to heaven? You say to me, Yes. And I ask you another question. It's called a diagnostic question. It's not a yes or no question. Why would God let you in heaven? He is righteous, unchangeably righteous. You've sinned. How can he wink at what you've done? Just turn to the guy next to you and share the three worst things you've ever done, would you? Just kidding. <laughs> You're going to have to. So how does a righteous God get an unrighteous person into heaven? How does he get a round peg into his square hole? How are you going to do that? If you started giving your resume on how good you've been, my friend, you just gave the wrong answer. That's the way you win your letter in football. That's the way you win your paycheck on Friday. It's the way you earn your degree. It's the way you get married. You've got to work hard to create the illusion that somebody ought to marry you. you know? <laughs> I tell you what, the Bible says you better say, and it's not given a particular book. It is from one end to the other. Every single page takes you to this end. What the Bible says is when God says, why should I let you in? Your answer had better be, for nothing I have done should you let me in. For the sins I have committed, you should not let me in. But I believe that you have spoken and you are true. And your word says that someone is coming. And that someone would be born in Bethlehem, 
of the family of David of the tribe of Judah. And he would be crucified for what I did. And when he died on that cross, this perfect boy who became a perfect man, who was perfect to the way of the Gethsemane, who the demons said he was the Holy One of God, when he died and God placed on him my sin to shed his blood unto the wrath of God for what I did, he cried out in the dark a question that was never answered. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he was announcing two things in that statement, that God had forsaken him. He was guilty. And when he said why, it meant that he was not forsaken for anything he had done. What was the answer to that question of why? Put your name in there. It was either you or it was him, and God took him. And so I am going to heaven. I'm as sure of it as the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. And he died for me. And I didn't just take that as an intellectual truth. By God's grace, it got in my heart. And I fled to my knees with empty hands, like every Christian does. And I said, nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Jesus said, whoever confesses him puts his seal to this, that God is true. God has spoken. And that is what a Christian is. It's one who trusts in Christ alone. Have you done that? Because when you do, two things happen. There's the imputing to you of a righteous state, and there is the imparting to you of a new nature. And so now good works are lived out because of your heart of love. But they are two separate entities, salvation and sanctification. You don't confuse them. Have you trusted Christ? You're probably saying to yourself, are you saying, has my faith found a resting place not in device nor creed? We ought to have a hymn about that. As a matter of fact, we do. Let's stand together, could we? And let's sing, my faith hath found a resting place not in device nor creed. I trust the ever-living one. His wounds for me doth plead. I need no other evidence. I need no other creed. It is enough that Jesus died, how's it go? And that he died for me. Hmm. My faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. I trust the ever living one. His wounds for me shall plead. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Enough for me that Jesus saves the sins my fear and doubt. A sinful soul, I come to him. He'll never cast me out. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Fourth verse. No one knows why Baptists write third verses. On the fourth. My great physician heals the sick. The lost he came to save. For me his precious blood he shed. For me his life he gave. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough.
enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Let's have a hand for sola fide. Indeed, Father, we have a hope that is uh, unable to fade away, indestructible and unreproachable, reserved for us in heaven who are protected by the power of God through a salvation to be fully unveiled in the last time. All because of the living hope of Jesus Christ, the anchor of our soul. Thank you, Lord, that you have categorically stripped from us all religious pride, all moral pride, all social pride, that we empty our hands and we stand having washed our cloak in the blood of the Lamb. What a precious truth. How wise Satan was to confuse this and remove the Bible, Christ, and Calvary from our salvation. How smart he was to reach into the nexus, the matrix, the hub, the essence of our faith, and to nullify it. Thank you, Lord, for the reformation and turning back to the precious truth of the Bible that Jesus saves. And Lord, if there is one madman here that chooses to die and joust with God, I pray that they would flee and surrender and become one of the family. And we'll ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.